who would win in a basketball game between Michael Jordan's 96-97 Chicago Bulls and Steph Curry and the 2015-2016 record-breaking Golden State Warriors? We can give you the answer using maths and something called the Z factor. The Z factor uses a statistical distribution which is called the normal distribution. So a normal distribution maps a set of data which has this kind of shape. So we have this bell-shaped curve, sometimes called a Gaussian, and if we say this is X and this is Y, then the center is at what we call mu, which is gonna be the mean. So the average value of our distribution peak's gonna be there. Most data points will be near to the mean. And then as we move away, things get less and less likely. Really common example would be like height of people in the UK, because I'm in the UK now. There's an average height, and then you've got a few people who are really small and a few people who are really tall. But most of them are grouped around the mean. And the power of the normal distribution is that it amazingly works for sets of data that you wouldn't even begin to think it would possibly work for. And there's all kinds of mathematical theory behind this. There's something called the central limit theorem. I'm not going to talk about that today, but homework, it's really cool, allows you to use a normal distribution in all kinds of really interesting situations. So we've got the peak, the central bit in the middle is at the mean. And then we have a measure of the spread it's called the standard deviation. And we call this sigma. So if sigma, the standard deviation is big, the data is nice and spread out. So if I were to draw one with a small standard deviation, but the same mean, then it might look a bit more like this. Okay, so this one would have a smaller sigma, smaller standard deviation. It's more clustered around that mean, whereas the one in black, the standard deviation is bigger, it's more spread out. Given a data set, you can work out the standard deviation. There's a formula, right? Uh, measures the, the distance of each data point from the mean. When we plot this graph for a normal distribution, we are plotting a mathematical function. It is important to remember that this is centered on the mean, so this is not x equals naught. This is centered on the average value of the data. So what's actually being plotted here is the following. We're plotting a function of x, which is rather complicated. One over the square root of two pi. Uh, we also have a sigma on the bottom there. And then we do the exponential e to the power of minus one over two sigma squared times x minus mu squared. So one over root two pi sigma e to the minus one two sigma squared x minus mu squared. That is that graph where the center is at mu and the spread is controlled by sigma. This represents a probability. It's a statistical distribution. So the area under the curve has to have a total of one because the total probability is one. So what this means is if I took like a value here, let's call this x1, and if I wanted to know what is the, suppose this is height and you know, average is like 5'8", suppose this is like six foot. I wanted to know what's the probability in the UK population of being smaller than six foot. I need to add up all of this area up to that point. So the area under your distribution gives you the probability. You add up all of that area. That's why for the red one, I drew the peak going taller because again, the total area under it, even though it's narrower, still has to be one, has to total one. So if we want to know the probability up to this point, x1, we know the total area is one. So if we wanted to know the probability that x was less than or equal to x1, so we can be anywhere all the way down to minus infinity up to this x1 value. We have to integrate, because that's how we find the area under a curve. We know the function, f of x. So we would be integrating from minus infinity, all of these values are allowed, all the way up to a maximum of x1, and we want the area under this curve. So we integrate f of x between those two points. Key thing, key relationship is, we want to work out probability up to a certain point. This is called the CDF or the cumulative distribution function. That's going to be important. We just simply integrate up to this point. So what it also means is if we have the CDF, if we differentiate it, the reverse of integrating, we get back this one, which is called the PDF, probability density function. So you integrate or differentiate to move between the two of them. That's that. So what does all of this have to do with basketball? The idea is we're gonna take the data for that particular season, the number of wins or win percentage of a team in that particular season, and we're going to try and create a statistical distribution. And this is an assumption, this is a mathematical model, but if you look at the distribution of wins in a regular NBA season or any other sport. There's an average number of wins that a lot of teams are clustered around. There's the champions who win loads down here. 
and there's the really bad teams who win very few. So it actually has really, really, really good for most sports and most data, as long as you have a lot of games, fits really nicely into this normal distribution model. So this is what we're going to use to allow us to construct a distribution for each season and then compare them. So the trick is we construct a normal distribution for the 96, 97 NBA season and find, you know, the Chicago Bulls are somewhere down here. We construct a separate, different normal distribution for the Golden State Warriors in 2015, 2016. They're also somewhere over here. But how do we compare them when they're both on different graphs across the different eras? <clears throat> Who knows, maybe the Bulls were playing weaker teams. Maybe all the other teams were rubbish in 96, 97. So who really cared? They were obviously going to win all their games, right? Again, you can have an opinion on this, but we want to get it down mathematically. So we've got two separate distributions for each team in each season. But what we can do is reduce each of them to what we call the standardized normal distribution. And that then allows us to compare what position are they on the standard one. In order to be able to do that, we need to figure out how do we turn a general normal distribution into the standardized one? And what is the standardized one? The normal distribution we have here with this complicated PDF, my random variable x is normally distributed mean mu and variance sigma squared. So the variance is just the standard deviation squared. Now, the standard normal, often referred to as Z, and this is where I think Z factor comes from, is a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one. So the question now becomes, how do we turn this graph, the, more, the most general possible normal distribution, into a naught one distribution? And the way we do it is you say Z is equal to X minus mu, so we subtract the mean away, hopefully you can see would turn this center point to zero, shift it, X minus mu shifts the graph to the left by mu, and then we divide by sigma. So we rescale by one over sigma. So this is the standardized normal. So you take your data point from whatever season it might be, 96, 97 bulls or the 15, 16 golden state. You subtract the mean off from that season and divide by the standard deviation of that season. And then you've got a value of the normal naught one, which allows you to actually then compare the Z factor. And that is exactly what the Z factor is. It's your data point minus the average from the whole set divided by the standard deviation for the whole set. And this is comparing everything on the same distribution, on the same graph, and it removes this idea of there being different eras, different strength opponents. That is all factored in because we've reduced everything to the standardized normal. So given we have our formula for the PDF when we have mu and sigma squared, we substitute into this formula where sigma is one, and mu is zero. So what I'm going to get is going to be one over the square root of two pi. Sigma disappears because it's one. We've then got the exponential of minus one over two, and then mu is zero, uh, and I've called this z instead of x, so it'll just be z squared. So now, if we were to plot this, it has the same shape as this, but comparing what's happened here, we've shifted it by mu, and we've rescaled a little bit by sigma. So what does this all mean? Well, we can take our distribution, our data point, from any time period in history, for any sports team in any sport, and we can then reduce it to the standard normal and then get the Z factor. And we can then compare those values as which one is bigger, in theory, you could argue says which team is better. Okay, so for a standard normal, and by this I mean the normal naught one, the one we're reducing everything to. If we are one standard deviation away on either side, so this is plus or minus one either side, then you can work out this probability because we know the probability of being between these two values is just the area underneath this curve. We know what the curve looks like, so we just integrate this between these two values. So what you will find is that being between minus one sigma and zero, this is 34.13% sort of percent probability. This is the same, 34.13% probability. Then if we go up to next ones along, two sigma or minus two sigma, which would be plus two or minus two, then this adds an additional 13.59%. And then we go up to three sigma and minus three sigma, and this will then give us an additional 2.14. And then being beyond that point, you're actually just 0.13%. We're gonna be interested in the good performers, because you can do the same for the bad ones down here, right? If you're, if you're in this little tiny thing, you're more than three sigma below the average, 
you are historically the worst team ever. And we're talking about here number of wins yes. in the season. And you could also do like number of goals, number of home runs, number of three-pointers. You just need to make sure that you define what it is and you need to have a large data set. That is important. So you want at least 20 data points, really, um, in terms of teams in the league to be able to have 20 points along the curve. Ideally 30, but most competitions have about 20, at least when it comes to football, my favourite. Um, I guess you've got 30 basketball teams. Um, and you also need to have a pretty good idea of that team's performance. So, for example, I did not do this for the NFL, American football, because they only play 16 games. It's a very small sample size to see if a team's actually good over 16 games. But in an 80-plus game NBA season, you've got a lot of data points there, which gives you a feel for just how good a team actually is. So once you start getting above two sigma beyond the average, you're really seeing something quite rare. You know, that could be... I wouldn't quite say once in a generational, but that's like, you know, you're a good team. You're getting above two as your Z factor value. You are really much, you probably won the league, put it that way, if you're getting a value up there. And then if you go three and beyond, then you're greater than 99.87% data. So a Z factor of over three is like a one in 800 team. So if you've got 20 teams in the league, that's like one in 40 years. So that you would argue is very much a generational collection of you know, performance from that team or maybe individual performance. So we're gonna kind of be looking at things from two onwards, right? Because that's when you're getting into like the real good teams. Occasionally you will see values above three. I've never seen a value above four, <laughs> despite doing this for all kinds of different sports and different data sets. But once you, there are a few of them that go above three. Uh, which tend to be, I think one example that comes to mind was Pele, the Brazilian football player. Uh, he had a season when he scored like 70 something goals in, in like 20 league games, which is clearly ridiculous. And that was like 3.8 on, on the Z factor. So again, regardless of his competition, that was just a once in a century level of performance. So you do sometimes see those, but this is the setup we're interested in. What is this Z value? And the bigger it is, the sort of more of an outlier that particular team is. So we started asking the question, <laughs> Michael Jordan's Bulls, Steph Curry, Golden State. So took the best season of both of them. The Bulls in 96, 97 had a Z factor of 2.06. Very, very good for sure. The Golden State Warriors had a Z factor in 2015, 2016, which is when they set the league record for the most wins in a regular season. That came out at 2.54. You know, if we're going to interpret this as who would win in a match, <laughs> I think that the maths would tell you Golden State of 2015-2016 were more dominant compared to Chicago Bulls of 96-97. But this doesn't take into account many, many things, obviously. Mm -hmm. The way the teams match up, uh, yeah. the way the teams perform under certain conditions. But it also doesn't take into account how much they won their games by. The Chicago Bulls could have won every game by 40 points and the Warriors squeaked a few by one yeah. or two points. Oh, absolutely. So there's, there's a, a very good question and a very interesting point you've raised because the 2016-17 Golden State Warriors are by many basketball analysts deemed to be better because the 15-16 team actually lost in the championship game, right? Whereas obviously the Bulls won. So even though they set the regular season record, they lost when it mattered, right? The one game you want to win, they ended up losing. Or best of seven games. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they lost it 4-3. Yep. Um, to, to Cleveland, it was. But the year after, um, the 2016-17, they won it. And also in that season, they, I think, set the record for the most points they won on average by. It was over 10 points was their average victory. So the 16-17 could be argued ha were a stronger team but their Z factor is actually lower because they won fewer games across the season. It's a really important point about all of statistics is what data did I use to draw this conclusion? So, you know, me saying this means Golden State would beat Michael Jordan's Bulls. I don't know that. <laughs> I'm just saying based on how many wins each of those teams had at their peak season, you know, their, their you know, highest winning season, the Golden State Warriors, from a mathematical perspective, that was more of an outlier than the, the number of wins the Bulls managed. So you can't really use it to conclude who would win, right? I was kind of joking a little bit when I said that. But we do have a measure that argues it was more impressive. It was a rarer event 
for the Golden State Warriors to win that many games in 2015, 2016. And that does take into account the level of competition than it was for the Bulls and their winning record in, in 96, 97. I guess the, the holy grail of sports statistics, and I know this is often sought, is to come up with one number or figure that encapsulates the strength and how good a team is. Yeah. But then you would take that across the generations and use this method to compare generations. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the question might be then, what is the suitable number or suitable data set to compare teams across eras? I've just used win, number of wins, win percentage, because it seemed the most straightforward. That's what sport's about. Yeah. <laughs> Ultimately, that is what sport is about. But then, yeah, so because, you know, because people would argue it's the number of titles you win. It's the number of trophies or versus, you know, who cares if you won the league and then lost the title game? No one cares. Is some people's opinion. But I just base this on wins because that allowed me to compare win percentage across different sports. So we've been focusing on basketball, but I have Z factors for other sports and other teams across different eras. Liverpool 2020 finally won the league after a long wait. Premier League football team. Brady's a Liverpool fan. I, I'm not a Liverpool fan. <laughs> um, their Z factor was 2.62, which is really high. So even better, higher than the Golden State one from 15-16. So that was a really impressive season from Liverpool based on the level of competition at that time. Um, then other famous Premier League football teams, you've got the Arsenal Invincibles. They went the whole season without losing a game. The only team to ever have done this in the Premier League. And that was a 2.53. So actually a little bit less. Man City got 100 points. They were known as the Centurions in 2017, 2018. That was 2.5. So again, around that kind of 2.5 level, but a little bit below Liverpool. And then my, my favourite team, Man United. So their highest Z factor actually occurred in 1992-93. So going back to almost one of the first few, or maybe even the first year of the Premier League, when they actually had a Z factor of 2.59. Still not quite as good as Liverpool's. <laughs> but the interesting thing there is that Man United team lost six games, which is a lot higher than you see in all of these other ones I've mentioned. But back in that time period, the early 90s, the league was way more condensed. Right. So you had you kind of had, I think United won it with like 80 something and you had so many teams with like 70, 60, 50, whereas take Liverpool in 2020, they were on like 99 and then it was like 81 for Man City and then it was like 50, 40, 20, 20. It was just the standard deviation here plays a part. And that's because it's comparing the particular performance to the strength of opposition at that time period. Other ones in football that I found interesting. So I looked at um, La Liga in Spain. Um, so Real Madrid's best season, according to Z Factors, was 2011-2012. They scored 2.85, which is actually the highest I found for any football team. They did score over, I think they got 100 and something points, 102 points that year. We also had Barcelona, the year Messi scored all the goals, which is the season after that. They scored 2.66. So again, really high. And then outside of football, I also looked at um, baseball. Um, I thought that would be an interesting one because you have more data points to play more games. Um, so I'll admit I'm not a huge follower of baseball, but... Some research online told me that there's an argument around um, the team with the most wins. So there's the 1906 Chicago Cubs had 116 wins. And then you had the 2001 Seattle Mariners had 116 wins, which as far as I'm aware is the record number of wins in a season. The Cubs had a higher win percentage. It was 76.3%. They won more of their games because you played fewer games in 1906 compared to 2001. However, Z factors, 1906 Cubs, 2.05, 2001 Seattle Mariners, 2.68. So really big difference there in the Z factor, which based on win percentage alone, even though the Cubs had a higher win percentage, the level of competition the Mariners faced clearly was tougher, which meant that according to this particular statistic of the Z factor, the 2001 Mariners actually were more of an outlier than the 1906 Chicago Cubs. I love this stuff. I love sports <laughs> statistics. You know, <laughs> the que you know, the question that's coming into my head is what is the lowest Z factor a team has won the league with? <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say like the worst team ever. But... No, the lowest Z factor, but you still won the league. I can figure that out. You can all figure this out. So we've, of course, talked about, started with basketball, talked about football, my favourite sport, a little bit on baseball. They're just the sports and as we've discussed, the win percentage, number of games won. That's just the particular data sets that I decided to apply this theory to. 
the joy of this, and this is a, let's call it a homework exercise for the interested viewer to throw out to you all is try this for yourselves. Pick your favorite sport, your favorite team, get the data. You just need to figure out what it is you want to measure, whether it's number of goals scored by a certain player, number of home runs, three pointers, number of wins of a team, whatever you want. Pick what statistic you want to compare across different eras, different time periods. Get all the data, work out the mean, relatively straightforward, the average value. Work out the standard deviation. Again, there's a formula. And then figure out your Z factor. It's just your data point minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. And you can figure out the Z factor for your favorite team in your favorite sport and see how it compares to all of the ones that we've looked at here. You could even compare players from different sports. Yep. Michael Jordan's three-pointers versus Don Bradman's runs. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> who, was, who was more exceptional? That's what the Z factor is telling you. It's like, how much of a surprise was this particular statistic, this particular performance of this particular person? Check out this great puzzle from episode sponsor Jane Street. The numbers represent the heights of Manhattan's skyscrapers and you need to place them in a very special configuration. It's all to do with what skyscrapers block other ones. Now Jane Street's a trading firm with offices all around the world, including New York. They've made this puzzle, well for fun really, they love making puzzles, but it's also to draw some attention to its upcoming Academy of Math and Programming summer event in New York. This is a chance for recent high school graduates who sometimes face barriers in their education journey to come to New York amongst the skyscrapers with all their expenses paid and to learn about game theory, data analysis, programming, all that good stuff. Now for more details on just what a great opportunity this is, well, have a look in the video description. Oh, and by the way, you don't need to like complete the skyscraper puzzle to apply for this program. It's just for fun. And you don't need to be interested in the AMP program to just go and do the puzzle as well. It's for everyone to have a go. There's the link and there's one you can click on in all the usual places.